higher energy, so we were able to extend to the higher, um, the hard X-ray and even the soft gamma ray uh, regime with integral. Um, also, SWIFT, Suzaku, and then uh, most recently, I've been really involved in the New Star mission for the last, um, well, since 2012, since launch. Um, so although most of my experience has been in x-rays, uh, I just also want to point out the, the great importance of using uh, multi-wavelength observations in order to understand x-ray binaries. So this is doing observations in the radio and the optical as well as the x-rays to understand the complete picture of uh, what's going on. Okay, uh, so uh, this kind of illustrates that fact. Go ahead. Yeah. So will, will that be any future mission? of the X-ray mission in space. Um, at the, the crash of the Hitomi. Yeah, so Hitomi uh, would have been great. Uh, Hitomi had an instrument that had a micro emitter that had great energy resolution. And uh, you know, they did a couple observations. Mm -hmm. The Perseus cluster, that's a nature paper. You know, it's it's you know, beautiful data. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it, only lasted for a week or two uh, before it burned up. <laughs> That's very sad. Um, so there definitely will be uh, another X-ray perimeter. Actually, um, it's supposed to launch in 2021. I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, there are also a lot of other planned missions, like Athena in Europe uh, and Lynx in the U.S. So they're both. Um, Athena is pretty pretty well on the way to being built. Uh, Lynx is kind of in the proposal, the proposal phase. So those are two big missions. And then there are a lot of other ideas for smaller missions uh, that people are, are working on. And I'll talk about some of them. Uh, OK, so uh, this uh, just kind of gives you an idea of um, an x-ray binary. There are two types of x-ray binaries, um, roughly speaking, low mass and high mass x-ray binaries. The low mass ones typically have companion stars that are about a solar mass or less than a solar mass. Uh, and that's what this is supposed to illustrate here, uh, even though my microphone didn't work. This, which it probably works, okay? <laughs> it didn't work out for me, it was okay. All right, um, so there are basically three places uh, in the low mass x-ray binary where we see um, most of the emission coming from. Uh, so one is the companion star, and so this is mostly optical emission, and it basically always produces a low level of optical emission. Uh, the second is the accretion disk, so this is the accretion disk. Um, it emits uh, from infrared to optical to x-rays, um, and the x-rays come from the inner part of the disk. You've heard a lot about this already, I know, so um, sorry if I'm repeating, but uh, the x-rays come from the inside and then you get lower energies as you go out. Um, a lot of these sources are x-ray transients and they can uh, vary in luminosity from about 10 to the 30 Earth per second to 10 to the 39 Earth per second in the x-rays. Um, the jet is the third place where we see um, a lot of emission and it it's in the radio, um, infrared, and the optical. And then there's a question that I'm going to talk about a little later about whether the um, base of the jet uh, might emit in the X-rays. Okay, so that's low mass X-ray binaries. High mass X-ray binaries, um, the big difference is that you've got this big star here. So typically, the um, companion in a high mass X-ray binary has a mass of greater than 10, 10 solar masses. Uh, and so that dominates the optical all the time. Uh, a lot of these are transients, a lot of these are variable, but still uh, the optical companion dominates the optical emission. Um, these are fairly rare, so Cygnus X1 in our galaxy is the best example of a uh, high mass X-ray binary with an accretion black hole. There are a couple other examples, but uh, Cygnus X1 by far is the best studied one. Uh, it has luminosity around 10 to the 37. So um, that range I gave you on the previous slide, 10 to the 30 to 10 to the 39, kind of goes up to about the Eddington limit. Uh, and this one's always about 1% Eddington. Um, okay, and then the jet is kind of the same story as uh, the limits of three binaries, where we know there's radio emission and, uh, and optical infrared, and then we're not so sure about it. Okay, so uh, I know you've heard a lot about this already, uh, but I just wanted to put kind of all the observational tools that uh, we have at our disposal on one slide, and so this is just a list of those. Um, so I know you know about light curves, but you know this is source intensity versus time. Energy spectrum is source intensity versus energy. Power spectra, I think you've heard maybe a little bit in previous, uh, from, uh, previous speakers, but not too much. Uh, this is variability amplitude, so you know how how large the amplitudes of 
variation R uh, versus frequency. And this is really the basic tool of X-ray timing. Um, imaging, I don't think you've heard very much at all about imaging. Uh, so imaging, you know, one reason you haven't heard about it is the binary separations for uh, these uh, X-ray binaries are very small. The angular scale for CX1, for example, which is actually a pretty big binary system, uh, is about 100 micro arc seconds, or 10 to the, 10 to the uh, negative 4 arc seconds. Um, however, we do sometimes see structure in these sources, and so this just gives one example, a famous example of um, a microquasar. So this is a black hole that produces radio jets, uh, GRS 1915 plus 105. And so what this shows is just six different radio images, and you can see um, you know, each one's a different time. This goes from, I don't know, March, I can't quite read it, to April 30th. Uh, so this is over a period of about a month. Uh, you see these blobs move away from the black hole. So the black hole is this cross at the center here, and then you see these uh, blobs of radio emission moving away from uh, the black hole. And so in this month, they got up to about one arc second. So that's what the scale is here, is one arc second. So this is done with radio interferometry. Um, so also occasionally, we actually see structure in the X-rays, and that's on larger scales. Um, and it's basically, as these jets continue to move out, eventually they run into the interstellar medium and then you start to see X-rays from those collisions. And we've seen that in three or four sources now. Uh, they're on larger scales, uh, 10 to 30 arc seconds. And they uh, typically are seen um, a couple of years after these ejections. So the ejection will occur uh, during, a, during a strong X-ray outburst. Uh, we'll see the, ra the radio jets early on. And then a couple of years later, we can see X-ray jets for, um, as we said, very small number of sources. Um, okay. Uh, the the fourth, uh, fifth thing is astrometry. So this is just getting positions of sources. Um, and so um, one thing you can do with that is uh, get parallax distance measurements. So um, who knows what parallax distance measurement is? Are you guys familiar with that? I'm guessing you are. Maybe you can pick one for that. Does anyone want to volunteer to say what a parallax distance measurement is? No? Again, it's taking my general astronomy. Parallax, it's like when Earth is rotating around this, the sun. Uh -huh. And if we watch uh, a star, relative to the distant background of the universe, the star seems to move a bit uh -huh. when the Earth is in a different position. Right. So by observing this, uh, this is called parallax. So by observing this, we can measure the distance of the star. Right. Yeah, so we, yeah, from the sun, right, exactly. So you see a large change, then uh, it's large, par yeah, large parallax, and that means the source is relatively close. So very good answer, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, this is something that, that's been done. Um, so X-ray binaries are fairly far away. And so, you know, this is, parallax distance measurements are pretty routine for nearby stars. But X-ray binaries, you know, the closest ones that we know about are a kiloparsec away, and then, you know, most of them are more like galactic center distance of eight kiloparsecs away. So their parallax are pretty small. And so um, there haven't been a whole lot of measurements until recently. So there's some radio measurements of these, of, you know, a handful of X-ray binaries. Um, but then with the Gaia mission, um, they've actually uh, measured parallax for a lot more. And that mission has been flying for a few years now. They're starting to get really good data. And so positions are becoming more and more uh, common in the optical for X-ray binaries. Um, so. That still doesn't help you so much when it's right in the plane, because if it's right in the plane, you've got a lot of extinction and you can't see a lot of the sources in the optical. So that's still a, a problem with some of them. But anyway, we're getting a lot more parallax distance measurements. Um, okay, so that's one thing you can do with astrometry. The other thing we're starting to be able to do is actually see the orbital motion for some of the binaries. So for SIGX1, the binary motion is about 30 micro arc seconds, um, and that hasn't been measured, that's just from theory. Um, Sam, you probably figured, figured that out. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the, the amplitude of the module of the, uh, the motion for CX1 is about 30 microarc seconds. Um, and so that's still a little bit too small for, for Gaia, this mission I was just talking about. 
um, but it's getting close to being possible. And then there's some larger binaries. Um, there's a pulsar uh, that's in a high mass X-ray binary system uh, called Pulsar B1259, uh, where we did a radio measurement of the orbit. So we observed the source um, you know, a dozen times as, as it went around its orbit. And, uh, and we were able to map out the whole, the whole orbit. So that's starting to become um, a possibility. And then the final um, technique or tool uh, is, is basically making polarization measurements. And that's done differently in the X-rays, gamma rays, or X-rays and gamma rays, and also in the optical radio. Um, the tool that I'm going to talk about in part of the lecture later is about using uh, modulation curves. So this just shows an example of a modulation curve um, from that first polarimeter that I said I worked on um, in the 90s. And uh, basically, if you have a very strong modulation, uh, this is just the, the scattered angle versus the count rate. And if you have a very strong modulation, that's the signature of polarization. And I'll explain that uh, more when I get to that part of the lecture. Okay, any questions on observational tools? Okay, um, so this is just kind of an outline of the, of the lectures. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the spin rates of black holes. Uh, most of this is uh, talking about energy spectra and a lot from New Star. Uh, I'm also going to talk a bit about gravitational waves and um, constraints on uh, black hole spins from the LIGO and Virgo measurements. Uh, these are not X-ray binaries. These are actually you know, black hole, black hole binaries that merge together. Um, then I'll talk about um, multi-wavelength observations, um, then high-energy polarization measurements, uh, including past um, observa observations with, this is from the 70s, so this is a long time ago. Uh, and then, then it's been, after that, it's a long time since uh, there was another uh, mission that's used polarization, but Integral, COSI, and Pogo Plus all have polarization capabilities. And then finally, this is a future mission, um, XP, uh, that I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, and then finally, X-ray timing, um, some of uh, the Ross X-ray Timing Explorer, and then this is a future mission called uh, Strobex that uh, is still in the proposal phase, but I'll talk a little bit about what it might be able to do um, when it launches, if it launches. Okay. Um, so this is by far the longest Getting one. I'm not sure exactly when we're going to take a break, but uh, it might be after this one or after this one. Um, we'll see how things go. Right, this goes till... Let's go to 3, 3, 3, no, 3, 3, 30, 3, 30. 3, 30. okay, all right, okay. start with um, in the introduction to black box binaries. Um, I've got a lot of examples of light curves and spectrum and things like that, so um, hopefully it won't repeat too much of uh, what you've seen already. Uh, certainly it's different sources. Uh, then I'll talk about three techniques for measuring black hole spin with x-rays, the x-ray timing method, the thermal method, and the reflection method. And here's where I'll talk a lot about new star. Um, then the gravitational wave part. Uh, and then finally, it's interesting to compare the measurements made with X-ray for X-ray binaries and uh, the gravitational waves. Uh, and so that would be important. Okay, uh, so um, this just shows going back to the first discoveries in the '60s of uh, black hole transients, uh, the rise in the number of X-ray transients over time. Uh, so the red here is the, the full number of uh, X-ray transients. And the blue here are the dynamical uh, black holes. So dynamical black holes means that there was a mass measurement made. Uh, the mass measurement of the compact object is more than three solar masses. Uh, and um, so Sandy talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, but the, the idea is that there's been a lot of theory that's gone into neutron star studies. And that theory has shown that um, neutron stars really can't uh, can't support themselves if they're more than three solar masses. So um, actually, we've measured a few that are around two solar masses. We haven't measured any that are close to three solar masses. Um, but even if you have them rapidly rotating and um, you know, you've got the stiffest possible equation of state, if they were three solar masses, they would still collapse uh, into something. And so we assume that something is a black hole. Um, so that's kind of uh, 
uh, what I mean by dynamical uh, plot fold is some, some thing where we've measured the mass of the compact object and it's more than three solar masses. Um, okay, so you can see this large rise. As we've got all these different X-ray missions over time. Uh, currently, we have about 60 um, black hole transients uh, and about uh, 20 or 20, 20 few, 20, 20 to, uh, between 21 and 22 um, uh, black holes with uh, dynamical mass measurements. Okay, uh, and then down here, this shows where they are in um, galactic coordinates. So the center of the galaxy is here. This is the galactic plane. This is the galactic population, so you can see that they're clustered around the galactic plane. Uh, the, the few exceptions, like this one here, uh, this is XCJ1118. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the angle is way out of the plane, but it's only about 1.7 kiloparsecs away, so it's actually not that far out of the plane. If you see what I mean. um, so this is the galactic population. And this talks about the, um, the uh, dynamical uh, black holes. Um, and so uh, this is kind of a little slide, that's why I kind of hedged on the number a little bit. But this shows 21 compact objects that have dynamical mass measurements uh, greater than three to the solar masses. Um, so this is kind of a nice plot. It shows several things. Um, the, uh, the size of the binary, so between the black hole and the companion, is to scale. And you can see that we've got some very large ones. This is a 34-day binary orbit. And then some very small ones down here, all the way down to four hour orbits. Um, also, the color of the companion tells you whether it's a high mass or a low mass X-ray binary. So these white ones here are high mass X-ray binaries. Um, so they're white because they're very hot. Uh, and then the uh, red ones are cooler. And so these are the lower mass uh, X-ray binaries. And then there's some that are intermediate, like this one here and this one here. Uh, and then also the inclination of the disk uh, is an indication. Okay, so some light curves. Uh, I just have a couple slides here of example light curves. Um, so this is from the full RXT mission with the All Sky Monitor. So this is uh, soft X ray band 1.5 to 12 kDV. Um, so I'm starting with an example of, of a source that didn't have any outbursts in 16 years, D4046. Uh, and typically, um, these, uh, these black hole X ray transients can have a very long period of time between successive outbursts. Uh, so this one actually finally did have an outburst in 2015, and it was 35 years uh, since the, the previous outburst. So uh, a lot of these sources can go into quiescence for long periods of time, and then come out of quiescence um, suddenly. And this was a really exciting event in 2015. I know this light curve is not exciting, but uh, it was a very exciting event uh, in 2015. It got very bright, it's very nearby. Um, black hole transient, uh, so I'm very excited. Okay, so we go from nothing to CX1, which is always on. Uh, so you can see a high level of variability for CX1. Uh, it also changes spectral states. I'll talk a little bit about spectral states, or maybe a lot about spectral states uh, in the following slides. Um, but this shows uh, just the variability of CX1 for 16 years. Uh, and then SWIFT J753 is uh, kind of intermediate between the two. It was in quiescence for a long time, it had a, an outburst here, but then it stayed in outburst um, for uh, it shows six years. It continued after the XG mission. In, in, in all, it was an outburst for about 11 years. A couple more examples. Uh, these are the two most uh, active um, X ray transients that we know about 4016 and 4016 4. Um, you can see in 16 years, this one had you know, about 10 outbursts, uh, this one had about five outbursts. Uh, and then some of them just you know, have one bright outburst, for example, just one, one bright outburst. So there's, a, there's a real range of uh, activities kind of here. So if you just looked at the soft X rays, you'd actually miss a lot about these sources. One thing you'd miss is that they have these state transitions that I mentioned before. So what this shows over here is a soft X ray light curve. Um, and so you can see in the soft X rays, this outburst, uh, this source kind of smoothly rises and, and, and decays away. Um, but in the hard X-rays, you can see that there are these huge changes. It goes from being very bright in the hard state uh, to dropping to almost nothing, and then nothing basically in the soft state, and then it comes back on at the end of the outburst. Uh, 
Um, so that's the sudden transitions. Um, this is actually these are two different sources, but they're just good examples of spectra that you see in the soft state and the hard state. So this one had, in the soft state, we see a very strong thermal component um, below 10 keV. And then in the hard state, that uh, sometimes goes away entirely, as this shows here, or sometimes there's a little bit of a soft component left. Um, but it always shows a very strong uh, power law extending the higher energy. Okay, and this is just another example of a, a source that's actually still in outburst you know, today. Um, and it shows very dramatic um, state transition uh, right here, um, where basically it started off very bright in the hard X rays, made this transition into the soft state. Uh, and you can see the soft X rays at the same time rose dramatically. Uh, and uh, this shows the spectral evolution. So it went from a hard state, which there are all these uh, curves here, to, this, to the um, so hard state, to the soft state, which has this thermal. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so I just told you a lot about phenomenology, about uh, measurements that are made. Uh, this is just a little bit of some of the stuff you've heard uh, in pre uh, previous speakers, but uh, there are basically two important radii uh, that I'll talk about, um, when I, especially when I get to spin measurements. Uh, so, you know, so one is the event horizon. That one actually is not so important for spin measurements, except that um, it kind of defines the range of possible spins. And uh, so the spin runs from negative one to one. Um, and the uh, event horizon is two gravitational radii for a non-rotating black hole. It drops to one gravitational radius uh, at negative one and one. And then if you try to go beyond that, you have imaginary uh, solutions. So that tells you that the range of the spin parameters is negative one to one. Um, the other important parameter is the, the ISCO, which you have heard a lot about. Um, I'm actually extending the range that uh, the previous speaker showed to go negative here. So negative means retrograde orbits. So these are cases where the particles going around the black hole in the opposite direction from the spin of the black hole. So the spin's going this way, the particle's going this way. And in that case, the, uh, the ISCO uh, actually is up at nine, um, nine gravitational rate nine. If uh, you have a maximally rotating black hole and the particle's going in the opposite direction. Um, Another key point is for a non-rotating black hole, and that's where we get six gravitational radii for the ISCO. And then uh, at a maximally prograde uh, spinning black hole, um, the, uh, the ISCO goes down to one gravitational radius. Okay, so this is just a little bit of motivation for why we're interested in measuring black hole spin. Um, seems kind of obvious, but uh, so uh, one thing is uh, to understand how relative this is jets are powered and launched. So one of the um, uh, prime energy sources uh, in these systems is the black hole spin. And uh, so actually you heard about the blind person uh, mechanism earlier today. That's one that requires black hole spin. Um, and uh, okay, so that's, that's one uh, question that uh, we can hope to answer if we have a lot of measurements of uh, black hole spins, we compare them to the powers of, uh, of the jets, for example. Uh, second is to probe strong gravity in inner disk. Um, so uh, if we ever wanted to actually uh, use these measurements to, for example, test you know, general relativity, uh, if we don't know the spin of the black hole, we're never going to be able to do that. So uh, we really need to measure the spin to understand uh, you know, what's, what's going on uh, in the you know, inner, inner regions of the uh, and then the third thing is, uh, what do black hole spins tell us about their formation and evolution? Um, so, uh, and that's actually what all this stuff down here is about. Um, and so, uh, I think you know, one takeaway point here is that high mass of three binaries, um, you know, the black hole spin that we're seeing now is the spin that the black hole is born with. Um, so, high mass of three binaries only lasts for about 10 to 7 years. 10, 10 million years. Um, so even at a very high mass accretion rate, uh, 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year, you can't change the spin very much. And that's what this plot over here is about. Basically, this is uh, how much mass you're accreting and how much you change the, the spin of the black hole for different emi initial masses. So for three solar masses, uh, initial mass, if you um, 
you know, you have to do three, about three more solar masses before you could spin, spin the black hole up to be maximally rotating. Um, and so you really can't, uh, you can't accrete enough for a high mass three binary. For a low mass three binary, it's a little bit less clear. Um, so you've got a longer period of time, the lifetimes of low mass three binaries can be a billion years. Um, but there's not enough mass, right? Because you've got a low mass companion and you need to you know, donate several uh, you know, solar masses just to change the spin a little bit. So this is a little bit uh, less clear, but it's you know, challenging to change the spin by very much. So by measuring the spins, we're actually learning a lot about uh, you know, how black holes form. Right, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering the uh, black hole spin here is like maybe the spin was, was observed for the, the almost at the same time when the black hole was formed. Mm -hmm. But maybe also had been spin up due to the accretion of the Okay, well, um, yeah, so I, I think, so that's what this is about. This is basically the accretion process and how much it can spin up the black hole. And uh, as I say, if you have a billion years and you know, you, had, you started off with a high mass star, so let's say you started off with a 10 solar mass star and then you were able to accrete nine solar masses, you know, then, you could, then you could do it. Um, you know, so there are some scenarios, I think, that, that work for low mass X-ray binaries. And there might be a small, you know, a fraction of low mass X-ray binaries that are significantly spun up. Um, and so my main point is really that the high mass X-ray binaries are very difficult to spin up. But it's, it's a good point. The low mass X-ray binaries uh, they might be able to do it. Yeah. The for high mass Definitely true in a lot of cases. I mean, SIGX1, there still is an accretion disk. So even if it's wind accretion at the beginning, um, you know, Sandy was showing some of this where you can go from wind accretion to a, to a disk. So I think, you know, it does eventually get to form a Keplerian or near Keplerian disk. Um, but yeah, for, for a lot of uh, high mass X-ray binaries, mostly with neutron stars, they are wind fed. Okay, any more questions? Okay, um, so that's a big part of this talk is how we measure the spin. So uh, I will talk about that. Um, and basically it has to do with the inner radius of the disk. So the inner radius of the disk changes depending on, um, on the spin of the black hole. And so I'll, I'll show, I'll talk a lot about that. Um, actually I'll start to talk about that now. So it's a very good question. Um, okay, so um, in fact all three methods that I'm going to talk about for measuring the spin rely on constraining um, the inner radius of the disk. And so this kind of repeats the same plot that I showed before, but just for the positive spins. Um, and basically, uh, you know, so for zero spin, we're up here at six. Anytime we measure an inner radius less than six, uh, then we're, you know, somewhere on this curve. Uh, and that means that we're on, at non-zero spins. So anytime we measure an inner radius less than six, uh, six gravitational radii, uh, then we constrain constrain the spin. So for example, if we measured five, uh, then um, you know, that would tell us that the orbit is less than five RG, and the spin has to be greater than 0.29. Uh, so yeah. Okay, so the first example is exactly the one that I just gave. Uh, and so there's actually only been one source that we used X-ray timing techniques to constrain the spin. And that was with the Ross X-ray Timing Explorer. Uh, and that was measuring this 450 hertz QPO that's shown right here. Um, so 450 hertz, 450 hertz um, you can look at this plot over here, which is frequency on this axis and, uh, and radius on this axis. And at 450 hertz, that takes us to five gravitational radii. 
You have to know the mass of the compact object, which is 6.3 solar masses for uh, this particular source. And uh, that tells us that the spin for this, uh, this object has to be greater than 0.29. Uh, so okay, so we've only done that for one source and it's just a constraint, so that's not all that interesting. Um, the next technique is uh, called the verbal technique. And, um, and actually, um, uh, Professor uh, Yuan yesterday, or uh, yeah, yesterday, talked quite a bit about, uh, about this uh, during his talk. Um, but basically, the idea is that you can model uh, the multi temperature disk uh, in order to uh, constrain the inner radius of the disk and then measure the skin. So, the three parameters in this kit are the um, inner radius of the disk and the mass accretion rate. Um, and so, you know, that's great, you can fit these parameters, but you have to know the mass of the black hole, the source distance, and the inner disk inclination in order to uh, get, the spin, get the spin out. Um, so, um, okay, so, so we, can, we can do that. Uh, and so just continuing with this example of LMCX3, um, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is a light curve here, so you can see that the luminosity of the source uh, goes up and down a lot. But even though it goes up and down a lot, the radius stays constant. And so we always measure this radius about 3.8 gravitational radii. Uh, and so this suggests that the inner radius did reach the, the ISCO. Uh, then if we you know the black hole mass for this source, which we do, uh, then we can use that uh, information in order to uh, constrain the spin of the black hole. We get about 0.25 uh, for the spin of the black hole. Okay, so the third technique is the reflection technique. So I'm gonna kind of uh, take a step back and talk about the different emission components that we see in X-ray binaries. Uh, and so this just shows kind of a cartoon picture for what the source might look, at, look like. There are two direct components. One is uh, thermal black body emission from the disk. So that's this blue here and this blue photon, so this blue bump here. Uh, then there's a high energy component from the corona. The corona in this, in this picture is uh, just this magenta, these high energy electrons. And what's happening here is the thermal photons are entering that region and then getting upscattered, so they're getting compromised. And that's producing uh, this red component here that goes to high energies. So those are the two, two direct components that we see. Uh, then the um, then the reflection component, which is what I'm really trying to get at here, uh, are these green photons. And so basically they occur when the quantized component shines back down onto the disk. And then uh, this photon uh, Compton scatters and produces this reflection component. So uh, there are basically three reflection signatures. One is the iron emission line. Another is the iron absorption edge, which is right above the emission line. And then the Compton pump uh, up at higher energy. Okay, so uh, this uh, gives an idea of how we use the reflection component to measure the spin. Uh, so this shows an example of a non-rotating black hole, and you can see the disk is uh, a little bit away from the black hole. Uh, and this is the reflection component, and it's not distorted. That's kind of the point here. Uh, when you go to rapid rotation, then the disk moves in. When the disk moves in, then you get distortion for a couple reasons. One is um, the velocity of the material going around the black hole is relativistic, and so you get Doppler broadening. And more importantly, you get this gravitational distortion. So you actually get a red wing to the line, to the line due to gravitational redshift. Um, and so you get a reflection front that looks like this. And the key uh, part of the spectrum to measure in order to constrain this reflection component is between about 3 and about 50 keV. And so that's where New Star comes in because New Star's band pass is 3 to 79 kV. Yeah. So I was wondering the, the, the refraction path that was on this, is, what's the size of this? What's the size oh, of that's a good question. And that gets to the question of what the source geometry is, right? So in some ways, that's why we, it would be nice if there was X-ray emission from the base of the jet because that's a pretty simple source that we can use to calculate the reflection. If the corona is more, you know, uh, more extended, uh, then it's more complicated. And so typically we use both models. We use 
a power law emissivity with the picture that there is this emission that's over the disk uh, and it's decreasing in strength as you go away from the black hole, and then a lamp post model, which is basically a source you know, at the base of the jet. So we usually try both models um, and see what the, see what the difference is. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, how, how, uh, how, how do you know uh, 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 which part of the emission is from uh, is from the the re, re, uh, re, reflection and uh, and or not or is is from? Oh, how, how do we know? Yeah. Uh, okay, so what I'm just I'm showing here is just the reflection component. So you're saying when we have when we have the direct emission and reflected emission? How yeah, because so? uh, because uh, what what we we observe will be everything. Yeah, right. Exactly. So how, yeah. how can you tell, tell Yeah, the so, so, the, so the model, I'm, I'm going to give a detailed example uh, in a minute, but um, it's a good point, and you know, the model will include everything. You're right, we never see anything like this. This would be really nice if we could just, that's almost, that's not quite true. So, so for, for black hole binaries, we, we, we never see this. There are, um, there, there are those AGN, actually, so Compton thick AGN, uh, where we just see a reflection and so, you know, there are some cases like that in the, for, for AGM. For X-ray binaries, um, uh, not so much. And so we have to, uh, when, when we model the spectra, we have to include the direct component and the reflection component. Uh, you know, and you know, then you really need good data. So that's kind of the point of using New Star uh, mm -hmm. is to get uh, really good statistics uh, and uh, and really high quality spectra in order to make these measurements. But, but but it's 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 not straightforward. It's a, it's a good point. So why the ion light so so significant in the future? The peak the is a narrow peak from the ion ion light. Uh -huh. So that abundance in ion is a lot of just due to the during probably six seven eight ten. Right. Well, in in some ways we're we're lucky. Uh, you know that iron is, is here uh, uh, because um, you know there are also lines going down to lower energies, but usually these systems are too absorbed to see them. So you know, the next one down is, is silicon, and it's already down at uh, you know two and a half keV or something like that. So you're already in a regime. Uh, I mean, the abundance for silicon is lower than iron. Iron is higher. Uh, and then also, uh, you're in a regime where you're starting to get absorption and, and it's harder to do the observations. Uh, and so it's a combination of, of the abundance being higher and you know, we see you know, all the emission from the iron. Anything else? Okay, so as I say, uh, New Star band passes uh, 379 keV, which is almost exactly what we want in order to do these measurements. Um, the uh, angular resolution that I'm giving here is 18 arc seconds. That doesn't sound very good if you're used to using Chandra or XMM or even Swift. You know, those uh, Chandra especially is sub arc second. Um, but when you consider that we're looking at these hard X rays, this is actually a pretty good angular resolution. And it gives us a really good sensitivity. And so we've got uh, better sensitivity by two orders of magnitude in the 10 to 30 keV band pass over any previous um, instrument. Um, so that's a big deal. Uh, the spectral resolution is about 400 electron volts at 6 keV. And these are broad lines. And so that resolution is basically just fine to do these observations. Uh, and then probably the most important thing about New Star is the throughput. So because of the way the detectors work, um, uh, detectors are CZT detectors. They have a triggered readout, so um, they, they're, they're only uh, live uh, uh, between events. And when, they're, when an event hits them, uh, then they basically shut off uh, until uh, they read out the electronics. And so if they didn't do that, then you could get what's called photon pileup. And that's a problem for Chandra and XMM and Swift, uh, where if, two fo if you have a bright source and two photons hit in the same pixel, uh, you know, then their energies add together. So that does not happen with New Star, and so we can actually build up very good statistics with no systematics or low systematics uh, in our spectrum. And so uh, that's kind of what's illustrated here. So these are all bright sources. Sigx1 are these three uh, spectra over here. 
and there are three other uh, block blocks for transients here. I should probably say what I'm actually showing here. What I'm showing here is called residuals, where you, you know, take the spectrum, you fit it with a power law, and then you look at what's left. That's the residuals. Uh, but you can see that in this case, what's left is pretty much the reflection features that I was talking about. The iron uh, fluorescence line, the iron absorption edge, and then the reflection onto the higher energies. And uh, you can see the very small error bars in these points means that we've got a lot of photons that we've uh, been able to add together. Uh, to, to, uh, to do these measurements. Okay, so um, SIGX1 is a very, I've mentioned that, that source several times now because it's a very nice source to observe uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one reason is that the parameters of the source are very well constrained. So we know it's a 5.6 day um, binary orbital period. Uh, the mass of the black hole is about 15 solar masses. The optical companion is 19 solar masses, so that makes this a high mass X-ray binary. Uh, the binary inclination is 27 degrees with very small uncertainty. Um, I used to give this talk, I'd be able to say the cross distance measurement is, is very good, 1.86 kiloparsecs. Um, but now with the Gaia measurement, it actually is a little bit larger than the rates of the radio measurement. This is a Gaia measurement. It's a little bit different. So these aren't quite consistent. Um, but still, they're pretty close, and it's you know, safe to say that the distance to the source is about 2 kiloparsecs. Um, so because it's close, uh, it's quite bright, and it's bright and has strong X-ray emission you know, as long as we've been observing it. Since the 60s, we've seen strong X-ray emission from Sigma 6 one So you can kind of, you know, it's easy to plan an observation of CX-1, you know, just do it. It's going to be doing something. Um, Okay, so this shows uh, a couple of light curves of SUGX-1. Uh, Maxi is an all-sky monitor that's actually on the International Space Station. So it observes from 2 to 20 kgb, uh, and that's the light curve up here. Uh, this is swift back, 15 to 50 kgb. Um, we've come up with a technique using these all-sky monitors to identify the different spectral states in SUGX-1. And so all the yellow points here are the ones when the source was in the soft state. And uh, so New Star between 2012 and 2015, New Star observed uh, SUGX1 four times uh, in, in the soft state. And it shows the spectra down here. So even just the raw spectra, you can see the broad iron line and the reflection hump. Uh, you can see it even better here. Uh, and so this shows the residuals when we fit with a black body and a power law. Uh, and so you can see the strong um, iron line and the reflection pump. Um, but what, also what I want you to see is this red wing of the line. So in all cases, you see this very strong uh, red wing that uh, is due to gravitational distortion. And that's what's giving us the power to measure the spin of the black hole. Uh, the other feature here that's kind of interesting is this dip here at 6.7 kV. So this is actually due to absorption of material from the stellar wind of the high mass companion. So you don't see this really in, in low mass X-ray binaries because they don't have a very strong stellar wind. But for high mass X-ray binaries, they have a strong stellar wind, they can produce absorption in the spectrum, and so that's what we see here at 6.7 kV. Uh, there's some difference in the strength depending on the orbital phase. So this is a case where the black hole is in front of the companion, and we don't see a very strong dip there. Uh, but when the black hole is behind the companion, we'll see the strong dip here and here. Uh, but the main point here is that we've got a strong red wing, and the strong red wing allows us to uh, measure the spin. Um, so this goes to the question of how we decompose the direct emission from the reflected emission. So uh, this shows all the different components that we use to get the spectrum. Uh, so the red line here is a power law. It's uh, the direct component. Uh, and then the magenta here is the reflection component, so you have to add in both components. Uh, also, there's a thermal component down here, and then um, a narrow uh, iron line, in addition to the broad iron line. The narrow iron line is actually a reflection off the companion, we think. It could be the outer disk, but it's probably the companion, where the x-rays actually hit the companion, and then we see a reflection component. It's cold, It's a 6.4. It's cold, yeah, that's right. So yeah, so that's just 6.4. Uh, and the relativistic line is, is more like 6.7. Um, OK, so when we put all those components together, we put the spectrum. Uh, this, show, this shows the results for the four different 
spectra. Uh, so what I'm showing here are error contours for um, inclination on this axis and spin on this axis. Uh, you can see that the spin of the black hole we're measuring is between 0.93 and 0.96, and the inclination is between 37 and 42 degrees. So does anybody know why these numbers are surprising? So these numbers are surprising because um, the binary inclination is 27 degrees. And so those numbers are, are significantly higher uh, than the binary inclination. And we've actually done three different studies. And in all these studies, we found inclinations in the disk that are significantly higher than the binary inclination. And this suggests a possible misalignment uh, in the system between the black hole spin and the binary orbit. Uh, which can happen if, uh, if when the black hole is produced, you get a kick. So it can kick the black hole out of the orbital plane, and then uh, the spin axis ends up being different than the binary axis. So that may have happened in this case. Uh, and what we might have is a warp disk that looks like this. So uh, we can't image it, we can't say for sure, but we can say that the inner disk uh, inclination that we're measuring is different than the binary inclination. And so uh, somehow, uh, this is a good explanation for what might be happening. So, you know, how do you get the upper limit for a speed? Right? So, the speed, there's range. Right. Yeah. yeah. The upper limit, from where do you get the upper limit? Um, Maybe we get the lower limit, right? Mm -hmm. and for a spin, you determine the. Oh, I see, uh, I see, I see. Okay. So okay. Right. So, um, the reason that I was. The reason that. Um, this is a measurement instead of the element, is that we are, we're assuming that the disk goes to the ISCO. So in the, hard, in the hard state, I think it's not a very good assumption. And so that's where I really want to deal with say that we have a limit that's not an actual measurement. Uh, but for the soft state, I think that we have, you know, so this our picture is that the, the disk actually goes all the way to the ISCO. Uh, and so, so that, that's an assumption. And if you wanted to say that lower, this is just a limit of 0.93, I wouldn't argue with you too much. So you goes a little bit inside this, because of the pressure. Okay, how much? If it's a particle dynamics, it goes up to its core. Uh -huh. But because a high accretion rate, the flow has a higher pressure, it goes up to inner sonic point, uh -huh. which is which could be 2.7 to actually areas rather than 3. So if you consider the deep, so even if the spin is 0.93, so you would be overestimating the spin because you will assume that it is three is the, you know, you are getting something you are executing with three. Yeah. In reality, it is happening at 2.7. Mm -hmm. so there is a small 10 percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that's it. Then, okay, so then I wanted to go back to this previous measurement in 2014 where they did claim a lower limit, but the lower limit was much higher than our range. So they claimed a lower limit of 0.983. But they were assuming the binary inclination and they used the thermal, the thermal method. These were all the thermal components for sig x1. Uh, so they were assuming um, the binary inclination when they came up with this limit. Um, we redid their calculation with a spin of point, uh, or with a, um, inclination of 40 degrees, and we get a spin of 0.96, which is consistent with the reflection measurements, which is nice. Okay, so I, I just gave the details for one source, SUG X1. Uh, we've actually done uh, spin measurements using, using the reflection component for nine uh, different uh, binaries, and so this shows the different values that we got. Um, yeah, so SIG X1 is here at 0 0.93, 0 0.96. Um, all of these are pretty high spins. Uh, I guess maybe this one's the lowest, uh, GRS 1739, but even this one is 0 0.8 plus or minus 0 0.2. Uh, so it's consistent with the maximum rotating time. So uh, I don't see GX339, for example. That is supposed to be 0 0.99 something. GX339 um, minus 4. Right. But it is not in your list, so I wanted to, I was wondering, uh, you didn't look at it or? We look, yeah, we, we've, we've observed it. Um, why didn't I put that one on the list? That um, is really one of the highest, uh, like 0.99, yeah. why it is there. 
No, no, in this list, but the earlier, yeah. just slightly. Oh, yeah. So, so I, let me go back and see. Yeah. So, so I think that the first one is the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so um, th so this shows uh, the new star measurements, but in the context of all the measurements that have been made. So the blue points here are the new star points. The black points are the points that have been done with the thermal method, and the green points are reflection technique before new star. Um, so you can see all the new star values are quite high, uh, but the thing I really want to point out is that in most cases, when we have multiple measurements, they're consistent with each other. I gave the example of SIG X1, uh, but you can see a lot of these, uh, you know, black here, green here, uh, green and black here. Most of these cases, we're getting good consistency between the different techniques. A couple of, couple of counter examples, GRO J1655. It still hasn't been an outburst during the new star uh, mission, so it would be really nice to do an observation of the source. Uh, with new star and get a blue point in here and see where it is, but just the previous reflection me measurement and the thermal uh, measurement are a little bit different. Uh, also this one down here, uh, 40, 15, 43, same thing, we haven't had an opportunity to do a new star measurement, but there's a little bit of this pretty good in those two. Uh, but there are 26 systems altogether where we've got uh, spin constraints. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the gravitational wave uh, measurements, um, and so I'm sure you've all seen this, uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, uh, but basically this was a merger of 36 and 29 solar mass uh, black holes, uh, you know, they, they you know, basically measured the change in strain during the uh, measurement, this was this is not, not on my list of, uh, of techniques that we use to measure extra binaries because you really need to have the two massive black holes to uh, do this detection. Um, so that was one case, that was the first case. Uh, and as you probably know, there have now been six uh, merging black holes that have been seen. So these are the blue um, black holes here. Uh, and one case of merging neutron stars shown here. Um, so this shows the mass on this axis. Um, so the masses of the uh, merging black holes. And then all these purple circles are the masses of the X-ray binaries. And so one question we'd really like to know is whether uh, the X-ray binaries evolve into uh, binary black holes that end up producing um, gravitational waves. You could put a public section. These are all public. All public. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's six now. There, there were three in the, in, in the first LIGO run, and there was one that was kind of a marginal detection, but that one, that one is shown here. And then there were three in the second run, and there have only been those two runs. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, no, no new results here. This is, this is all published up. Okay, but the question we want to ask is whether the whether the X-ray binaries are the progenitors of uh, of the binary black holes. So um, you know, one one question you can ask is whether uh, you can you know make the evolution work. Basically, so this shows an evolutionary scenario where you start with two massive stars, you end up with two massive black holes that eventually merge. Um, there are actually two X-ray binary phases, both high mass X-ray binary phases. Uh, that occur in this uh, in this time sequence here. You know, so one is here where you've got an evolved companion and a, and a black hole and the black hole's a green. This is kind of like SIG X1, or it's like SIG X1. Uh, and then there's another um, another phase where you can have an X-ray binary uh, where you've got a wolf or A star, which is basically just a helium uh, core. So this is, this is a star that's lost its uh, hydrogen envelope and just has a helium core and the black hole can accrete from that. And we actually know of, of three good cases where this is happening, IC10X1, uh, GC, uh, NGC300X1, and SIGX3, um, all uh, have this happening, and a couple other candidates where it's going to happen. So there are two places where you can have X-ray binaries in this, in this sequence. Questions? Yeah. So I was wondering the, the, the mass of all these uh, two 
Yeah. Well, I mean, so so this is not too specific, but you know, it depends on what which you know which which of the binaries you're talking about. The, the one difficulty of this thing is transaction from C and D. So I think it's worked out by Chris Chris Yeah. Uh -huh. So the transaction between C and D is a sort of little bit. Just want to make a black hole. So this if that black hole is either is associated with sort of like a supernova arrangement or exposure, yeah. then usually knock out the system. So right, right, right. Yeah. So right, exactly. So um, right, even if there are um, high mass three binary phases, there's a large fraction of the high mass three binaries that when the second um, black hole forms. The wire will be disrupted. So, yeah. this is a good point. So, yeah. 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 So make, you, you know, a lot of these systems. Magic. Right, exactly. Since you asked about the numbers, I did have a slide with the numbers. This was a case where they were trying to explain that first merger that had the very large mass black holes. So, we yeah. could scale everything down here for some of the, some of the later uh, mergers that they saw. But that first one with the 36 and the 29 solar masses. Um, they, uh, this was, you know, uh, Belchinsky did this work, and he started with a 96 solar mass black hole, or sorry, um, star, and a 60 solar mass star. So that's, that's the answer. That's, that's pretty major numbers. Yeah, those are pretty major numbers. <laughs> yeah, John, just want to make a comment that they are only finding the masses without talking anything about the spins. So they don't even have, a, have templates. You know, they, they are not even trying to measure the spins. So if you include the spin, the masses may go down. I mean, the, the masses they are calculating, and none of them, as you will see, they are never talking about the spins. Well, it, OK, I'm, I'm going to talk about this. But they, they, they can't measure the spins of the individual black holes. But they do uh, measure what's called the effective spin. So just wait a couple slides, and I'll get there. Um, OK, so that, that was the extra binary scenario. The other kind of competing scenario is the capture scenario, right? Where you've got um, black holes that form. These could even originally be in binaries and get kicked out of binaries. Um, but then they're floating around in dense uh, star regions like globular clusters. That's just a picture of a globular cluster. Um, and then these you know, black holes can actually uh, find each other and, uh, and form a binary that, that way. Basically, it's the capture scenario. Two black, two Massive black holes uh, capture each other in a binary. Um, going back, you know, 10, 10 or 20 years, the conventional wisdom was that we don't have black holes in globular clusters because uh, we've observed a lot of them, and typically we see uh, most of these neutron star systems. But now there are several examples uh, where there's, there's evidence for black holes in uh, these globular clusters. And so it seems like black holes do form in globular clusters. Um, also, there have been some careful studies of predictions for how many we should see, how many LIGO events we should see during the 01 run and the 02 run uh, from, from globular clusters. This is uh, you know, studying the entire universe, basically. Uh, and the numbers aren't too far off. So um, you know, these are large ranges, but the prediction is 0.2 to 2 and during, during the first run, and we actually have three detections and 3 to 45 during the second run, and we have three detections. So um, it seems like there are these, these calculations anyway suggest that there are enough, um, it, you know, uh, enough capture events that could happen to produce all at once. So John, did the black hole in global cluster, are they isolated? isolated black holes? So none of these have dynamical measurements. So uh, this one, the evidence is that the luminosity of the source is you know, a few times 10 to the 39. Um, these are, the evidence in these cases are where we've got radio and x-ray measurements and the ratio of the x-rays to radios uh, matches very well with other black holes. So these aren't even close to dynamical measurements. You know, you can imagine trying to observe one star in a globular cluster and it's very difficult just because it's so crowded. Um, so it hasn't been done yet. Okay, so the question then is if 
you know, both of these scenarios are possible, then can we use the spins to distinguish between the two um, possibilities? And so these are just some project, uh, predictions for uh, what we might have in the two scenarios, the x-ray binary scenario and the capture scenario. So in the x-ray binary scenario, uh, we should really look at the high mass x-ray binary spins. Um, but uh, in this case, we've got three high mass x-ray binaries with high spins and one with lower spin. Uh, so generally, just based on this fairly limited number of sources, we would expect the spins uh, to be pretty high. So this, this would be one prediction. The other prediction is just based on those binary, those uh, evolution scenarios I was talking about. You know, you've got angular momentum in the in the binary orbit, obviously, and so you expect these spins uh, will align uh, to some extent with the um, with the angular momentum of the binary. Um, I was talking about sigma x one and the warp disk and the possibility that there was a kick, so you can get you can get some deviation from that, but um, overall there should be some tendency. Uh, for the spins to align with the other momentum axis. On the other hand, in the capture prediction, one clear prediction is that they would be uh, uh, isotropic spin directions. You know, two black holes uh, you know, in a globular cluster finding each other. The spin directions could be any direction, so uh, those should really be random. Okay, um, so here are the spin results. Uh, for the LIGO measurements. Uh, so as I say, LIGO doesn't do a very good job of measuring individual spins of black holes, but what it does do a good job of measuring is uh, what they call the effective spin. So if this is maybe my first equation. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the definition of the effective spin. Uh, and so what this basically is, is you take the individual spins, you project them onto the angular momentum axis, and then you add them up. And so this, the length of this vector is the effective spin. Um, so what we see here is that in five out of six of the uh, black hole binary mergers, uh, the effective spin is consistent with zero. Uh, which either means that the spins are quite low or that their uh, directions are random. Um, and then there's one that's a little bit, a little bit positive. Uh, okay, so, um, and so since, since with the extra binaries we get individual black hole spin measurements and in the gravitational wave case we're getting the effective spin measurements, um, it's not entirely straightforward to compare the two, but I've done my best here to compare the two distributions by taking the distribution of X-ray binary black hole spins and then randomly pairing them up um, and making some assumption about the alignment. So the solid green line here shows the cumulative distribution. So this is just um, going from zero to 0% 0 to 100% basically. Uh, and so this is the cumulative distribution uh, for X-ray binaries if they were aligned. You can see they're much, much higher than the gravitational wave measurements here. Uh, even if you allow the um, alignments to be different by 45 degrees, uh, then you still only drop the curve down to about here. You have to go to isotropic spin directions uh, to go down to where the gravitational wave measurements are. And we don't expect that for the X-ray binaries. So it's really looking like there's not a great match between the spins of the black holes and extra binaries and the black hole binaries. And there, um, there are some, you know, here's some possible reasons. You know, one might be that the black hole binaries really are mostly from captures. Uh, another, way, another possibility is that somehow the extra binaries um, do produce these black hole binaries with mis misaligned spins. Um, you know, the SIG X1 example, it's only 15 degrees misaligned. So it's not very misaligned. You need to do a lot more than that in order to, um, to actually uh, explain what we're seeing. Um, selection effects is a possibility, and systematics is, a, is another possibility. Well, for this scenario, the very difference is the same as the binary band. It's all creation of the Well, the binary So if, 
So it's not that surprising. suggestion that uh, this is the selection effect possibility, that the higher mass black holes have, uh, have lower spin. Um, so here's a case where you could actually um, produce the distribution that we're seeing with x-ray binaries. That's a possibility. Just from the um, binary angular momentum, you end up with 0.7. So the lack of spin can be greater than for the same only due to accretion. Well, or it could be born higher. Oh, 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 and that, and that's, the, that's the whole question here is whether they're born higher than 0.7. Yeah, that's the whole question. And from the measurement of sig x1, I would argue that uh, you know, there's a case where you have a black hole that was born uh, with a spin higher than. Okay, so it's just there's a few other possibilities to explain uh, the, you know, what we're seeing. You know, one is that the high mass black hole might have a lower spin. The next thing is that we might have some selection, selection effects for X-ray binaries. So uh, one possibility here is that um, the cases where we've got strong reflection components are the, the sources where we have the high spins. You know, and, the, and we do see plenty of uh, black hole systems that have very weak reflection components and we can't make a spin measurement. And it's possible that those actually have the lower uh, spin black holes, uh, you know, but we can't tell because we can't do the reflection measurement. So that's another possibility uh, that would be a selection effect. Um, the third thing is that uh, we do have to think a little bit about systematics for our X-ray measurements. Uh, you know, so we're measuring all these uh, spins from the reflection component. There's a lot of physics that goes into the reflection component. There's fitting uh, that where we have to use the multiple components with the direct component. So there's quite a bit uh, that goes into that. And so we do have to think about whether there are any systematics uh, based on the reflection uh, measurements. And then also, I already gave an example of a thermal method where the inclination of the inner disk does uh, change the spin measurement uh, somewhat. And so it's another systematic way to work. So um, there's still work to do here. And actually, the next slide is what you just mentioned, and that is that. You know, one thing that we do know is that the spin of the black hole after the mergers is about 0.7. You know, and that's true for all uh, six of these cases. Uh, very natural. Yeah, it's very, it's very natural to get 0.7. You know, the question is, can you get 0.9 or you know, 0.99? Okay, uh, so now this goes through all the different techniques that I talked about and talks about prospects for uh, doing more of these measurements in the future. Uh, so for the extra timing technique, I just showed you that one example. Uh, you, need, you need a case where you've got a black hole with a measured mass, uh, and then you have to get a you know, measurement of the QPO at high frequencies. The frequency has to be high enough so that you can, strain, you can strain the spin. So you need a lot of different things, and that's why it's only been done for one source. Um, 
But if we had a larger emission than XTE, a larger effective area, we can actually measure more uh, high frequency QPO. So that's probably the path forward there um, for uh, using this technique more. Uh, the thermal technique, uh, you know, one critical thing is to get uh, distances to these uh, systems. Uh, so with better X-ray sensitivity, we're starting to be able to reach to nearby galaxies. So you know, an X-ray binary in a nearby galaxy has a very well constrained distance. Uh, we still have to get the inclinations for those guys, but um, you know, it's possible that as we get more sensitivity, we can uh, do more of the thermal uh, technique measurements for these bands. Uh, reflection, I think the models are really what we need to continue to improve there. And then gravitational waves, um, you know, for the next LIGO run, uh, next year, I believe, uh, you know, there'll be a lot more black hole, black hole mergers, and hopefully there'll be a black hole neutron star merger. Uh, it would be really interesting to see if that black hole uh, is high scan or not. And then the final thing is X-ray polarization, which I haven't talked about yet. It's in a future talk, but this is another possibility for um, where we might be able to uh, uh, improve constraints on, on the scan. Okay, so that's the end of that lecture. Um, other questions? So, John, how do we tell the black holes means from the gravitational wave? Maybe we have two black hole merger and the number of the black holes. Merger the gravitational wave in the institute of the new black hole merger. Uh -huh. What the, the result effect on the on the suture, yeah. That's really not my area, so I, I can't. Just, I can't. It doesn't mean that you found fish in the temperature. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. There's not a lot of calculations. Yeah, there's a lot of calculations. Yeah. Yeah. Simulation. Uh, computation. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yes. Do you have any comment? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then you may computate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Right, so that's why actually one reason I mentioned the, the black hole neutron star case, because there has been quite a bit of work on SUGX1 in particular, and uh, you know, the predictions there are that it will end up being a black hole neutron star instead of a black hole black hole. And so that's you know, one reason I say it'd be really interesting to see what the spin is for a black hole neutron star. It could be that the black hole black holes are uh, you know, really uh, mostly uh, from the capture events. Uh, that seems to be a, you know, a likely possibility. But the black neutron stars, especially if uh, we see the high spin uh, in that case, might mean that that's where the X-ray binaries are going. Yeah. Other questions? Was that it? Yeah. yeah. Is there any method to know the origins of the black holes captured by the Gobi clusters? The origin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the estimates are that only about one percent of the binaries will stay together, you know, after, after a, a supernova event. So most most of the binaries should be disrupted, and so there really should be a lot of black holes floating around in in space in their clusters, uh, you know, just by themselves. And so that all that stuff goes into those capture uh, estimates that I that I showed on that one slide, uh, you know, just predicting. Yeah, but, but yeah, so that, that's that's where those black holes, they could still come from binaries, but they're binaries that were disrupted and then they end up as individual black, you know, black holes. Yeah. But the globular clusters, they have mostly their metal core, and if the metal core, they are really evolving with a much, much longer time scale. Uh -huh. And therefore, you will not be able to get, I mean, not too many black holes are expected because they are not evolving. And they're taking a long time to evolve. So you okay. mentioned now there are some examples there, some black holes. No, well, not, it, is their, it is their model. It is their saying every time you, every time you discover a new set of people, a new set of objects, you have to discover a new set of scenario to explain them. Yeah. So all the X-ray people uh, would have been happy between if they found between 5 and 15. Yeah. We would have been very happy. Right. 
but we don't see that they, as, as soon as you try to catch them, they say, no, no, we found something else, and their origin is also something else. Yeah. So th that is what we are unhappy yeah. about. That was a big result of that Belchinsky paper also, was that those, you know, those very high mass stars you know, did have very low metallicity. Yeah. So that, was, that was required. Otherwise, you get very strong winds, you know, and then you blow away with most of the matter, uh, most of the mass, and the black holes end up being small. So, yeah, we, we can break here, or? Yeah, 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 have a break and come back in 30 minutes, yeah? Okay, come back at 3.50. Okay, good.